Once upon a time, there was a land of dolls and living puppets. This world was called the 1970s, where stop-motion magic reigned supreme and whimsical fantasy for children was maybe just a bit more nightmarish than you'd expect. In this adventure, there may be language and subject matter better suited for older dreamers. Listener discretion is highly advised. <laughs> also, be prepared to have the entire Nutcracker fantasy spoiled if you haven't seen this before. And of course, all opinions expressed by the hosts are of their own mind, not necessarily reflective of the group as a whole. With that out of the way, all you children who love stories, come gather round for a special Christmas tale. Merry Christmas, everybody! Thank you for joining us here tonight. I know you're all busy between your holiday wrapping and your bargain hunting for online deals and Cyber Monday stuff, but... We wanted to say welcome to a very special holiday episode of the Dub Talk Podcast. Woohoo! Woo! It has been uh, it's been a while since we've done like a holiday themed anything. So uh, I uh, want to say thank you all for joining us here tonight. And um, if you thought that maybe we were going to cover something uh, that everybody had heard of before, uh, well, that is where you are sadly mistaken because we are pulling a retro episode here tonight. Yes, we are going back in time once again to cover a beloved yet sadly under-remembered holiday movie from the fine folks of Japan. And yes, this is the Dub Talk Podcast where we talk about the dubs, both old and new, and see if they hold up. So as you can guess, we are going to be talking about a movie that has an English dub attached to it. But before we get into that... I need to say, first and foremost, that I brought the two greatest gifts of all to this celebration. First off, I brought the fine gift of music nerdery. Yes, those hipster men who still listen to their vinyl, who still listen to the latest Steely Dan at tracks, and who know everything about music more so than anyone else here. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Amon Duel. Hello. How are you doing tonight? Festive. Excellent, we're going to need that. And as an additional special guest tonight, we have a returning guest from uh, one of our previous retro episodes. Yes, she was instrumental in understanding the world of Tezuka Productions and the Anime Rama series. So it was fully fitting that we bring her back to talk about yet another troubled but very interesting history of animated filmmaking. Everyone, please welcome Megan! Oh man, I was settled in with my eggnog. I was expecting something like Rudolph. What the heck did I just watch? Wait, wait, I thought that's what we were covering. Wait, let me check the credits here. No, uh... Wait a no, minute. Uh, no, we've been over this. Uh, I, 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 uh, but but I, all my notes were about the, the, the Rankin Bass Rudolph special. I, I had all these fan theories and how they had an extended universe and what... what uh, aww... <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. I'll I'll do the anime thing. Fine. You Japanese Japanimation people, you just want to take over the world, don't you? What do you mean wanna? What's no, this? Just, what's, this just... what's this future tense? Also, I mean, this is are... one you can't blame Rankin Bass for. Yes, you can. Uh, to bring up to that point, there. So, what are we talking about tonight? Well, uh, as much as we normally cover uh, hand-drawn or sometimes CGI animation on this podcast, tonight we're Covering into the very rare, but extremely interesting realm of stop-motion animation. And you're thinking, wait, the Japanese made stop-motion animation? Yes, they did. And you have absolutely seen some of this before. Because I- I'm going to ask you too. Have either of you seen any holiday Rankin-Bass specials? Uh, Santa Claus is Coming to Town, Rudolph mm-hmm. the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Have, have you mm-hmm. guys seen those before? Yeah, I had, oh, a, yeah. T- I had a TV growing up. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Well, did either of you know that the animation for those was actually done in Japan? Well, I did, but that's because I did a lot of research about it. Yeah, I definitely learned that from somebody, like, as an adult. Not at the time, though. At the, when I was, like, you know, six, I did not know that. In yeah, fairness, did... Rankin Bass did that on purpose. They kind of <laughs> downplayed the Japanese side of things, I which can't... has made it really tricky to track down, like, the actual animation credits. Difficult. Mm-hmm. 
and it's not even just in their stop motion stuff. They they outsourced. Uh, uh, I, I think it was Toei Animation did the work on stuff like Thundercats too. Well, that was after the Top Craft split. Uh, split. But yeah, during Rankin right. Bass's prime, they uh, sublicensed stuff out to Mushi Productions, to TCJ, to Toei, and most notably to Studio Top Craft before it split into Ghibli and uh, the other uh, studio. Right. So, and I'm glad you brought that up because uh, for those who don't know, Topcraft uh, was a Japanese studio that had uh, probably their most famous thing they did was they eventually did Nausicaa Valley of the Wind. And then a lot of the staff from there after that split off to uh, join Hayao Miyazaki and Isao Takahata to make Ghibli. Um, but I believe uh, that a lot of the staff for that were uh, doing, uh, I'm trying to remember, what, what our Topcraft stuff was kind of made before that split happened? The Last Unicorn and um, Return of the King, the, the they, Ho Hobbit animated film that Rankin Bass made. Rankin Bass yeah, was so, like, we need fantasy shit that's not 3D. Get that uh, top craft company. <laughs> uh, the Flight of Dragons, which most people don't know about, but my husband adores. Um, and a whole bunch of 70s uh, Saturday morning cartoons, like tie in stuff for like the Jackson 5 or the, the Jackson Osmonds. 5. Yes, oh, absolutely. no. <laughs> The Jackson 5 cartoon is probably one... I think that's one of the better uh, based-on-a-real-life person cartoons that came out during that time period. They even got Diana Ross to voice herself in the uh, very first episode. So th there was some clout behind that. Yeah, but we're not technically talking about Rank and Bass today. We're talking about a completely different company. You are absolutely right. Because, as you were saying, the animation for a lot of those Rank and Bass specials was done in Japan by MOM Productions. And the staff behind that eventually got commissioned to do a movie, not for Rankin Bass, but for, wait, wait, the Hello Kitty people? Well, yeah, you just talked about them last time. That is, we did. And I'm glad that you're here to talk about this because we kind of scratched the surface about Sanrio in our um, Unico episode. But there is so much more in this time period here, this late 70s, early 80s time period, where they were essentially trying to be the Japanese Disney in terms of feature animations and breaking into the West and didn't really work out for them, unfortunately. And it's really sad if you see how much time and talent they put into these features around this time. Right. And this film was literally four years in the making. This is one of the first films they planned as part of that film initiative. Mm-hmm. And as far as I can tell, this was the last one to be screened in American theaters, as all of Sanrio's animated features afterwards, including that Unico movie you just talked about, all went straight to home video in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Uh, straight to video and uh, television uh, streaming. Not streaming, but television <laughs> broadcasts as well. <laughs> Analog streaming, a.k.a. broadcast television. Admit <laughs> Admittedly, the release for this went a little better than the other film Sanrio uh, put out in 1979, a film previously known as Metamorph Metamorphoses, based on the, the Ovid stories, which was this big, lavish, 70 millimeter animated film, cell animated film, that was meant to be like their Fantasia, and it had ended up becoming this huge disaster. They had to completely re-edit it and re-release it under the title Winds of Change. They changed what was supposed to be all this licensed rock music to a bunch of no names from a disco label. It, and it, as far as I'm aware of, it's only ever had VHS release in the U S and UK and maybe a Japanese DVD release. It's very obscure. Me Megan, yeah. Megan, I need to ask this question. Even if it, you don't have an answer, was the disco label Casablanca? Of course. <laughs> of course. The old Bogart strikes again. Who else could so, be? But yeah, it's kind of curious to realize, you know, Samuel's earliest stuff included stuff like you go from Ringing Bell to this. Oh, God. Yeah, Ringing Bell was the first that actually got released, right? Um, there was actually a short film called uh, Waxana Jumbo, Little Jumbo, although it was made by the uh, same director and same studio, obviously. But they were both kind of short-ish films. They're not feature length. So that, yeah, that brings us to the, this one right here, which stands in stark contrast because, like uh, you were saying, all those other features from Unico to metaphor Metamorphoses were all hand-drawn. This really stands out that they, that Sanrio, that Shintaro Suji, in his infinite wisdom, looked at the stop-motion styling of Rankin-Bass specials and thought, 
that's it. If we make a feature length one of those, that's going to hit big in America because they love that shit over there. And it's just not unsurprising. Rankin Bass have been doing 10 years worth of specials that had, you know, been rating semi-successful up to that point there. So I guess it's not unsurprising that he thought, okay, we're going to make this uh, movie in this style using Tchaikovsky music, which is big in the West, and get it released in theaters using our connections over there. And that's what's going to make us the big household name in America. We are, as they said in Beck, going to hit in America. Didn't exactly work out for them, unfortunately. Nope. It's so sad. It really is. They tried. That that was basically how it went with all of their feature films. They were all these beautiful, Every lavish, animated one. things that took Bomb. many years to produce, yeah, and all of them underperformed. It's so sad to watch. It, I, I mean, and it's not like it, this is like nepotism, like sometimes you get uh, rich people who just kind of force product out. This was like very passionate, very immaculately produced. If, if it was like, I don't know, if it was like maybe the wrong time period where audience appetite for this kind of production was, you know, more suited towards it, it probably would be more well received and we'd be living in a very different world now, but it just wasn't the time for them to release these kind of movies. It was also just not a good time for international releases of Japanese animated features, period. Uh, they had attempted some releases earlier in the decade, stuff like a group tax version of Jack and the Beanstalk, but again, it just went nowhere. But I'm, I'm luckily, uh, this was not lost uh, because unlike stuff like Metamorphoses, which is very hard to find now, we are very fortunate that the Nutcracker Fantasy is actually available streaming. It got relicensed by Discotech, who not only remastered it to look really good, but also got the dub, the English dub for it, uh, ripped from a Betamax tape and is mm -hmm. now readily available up on Crunchyroll and home video for you to enjoy this holiday season. Yeah, they were able to rescue what, what's referred to as the international cut, and it should be noted it's a little different from the original Japanese language version. They edited about 13 minutes worth of content. Mm-hmm. And they also, they, I mean, we'll get into this when we get into the writing section of it, but th yeah, they made some changes to it to make it a little more, uh, I suppose, American-friendly. Um, Kid-friendly, at least. Mm. It... it didn't really take away uh, all of the nightmare elements, um, and I'm excited <laughs> to talk about that. <laughs> Two-headed mouse queen. Oh my god. So, so before we get any further, let me uh, let me tell you fine folks out there what the Nutcracker fantasy is about. Because I went into this completely blind. I didn't know what it was about. Maybe you'll understand it, because I don't. So, is it a dream, or is it real? That is the question for young Clara, a young girl who is given a Nutcracker doll by her uncle Drosselmeyer, and in the film, she enters into a fantasy realm where she looks like Princess Mary, and Princess Mary is asleep. She has been put to sleep by a spell by a two-headed mouse queen named Queen Morphia. The entire movie is the residents of the kingdom, Clara, and all the other characters trying to bring Princess Mary back awake, and all helped with the wonderful Franz, or Fritz, who is essentially an upstanding Nutcracker soldier character. And, well, uh, let's just say there's a lot of tripping balls done by the animation studio throughout the course of the uh, adventures in the Nutcracker fantasy. What, you don't remember the part in the Nutcracker where, you know, there's war with the, with the mice and, and dark forests and, and clockmakers with split personalities and weird dream sequences involving dancing sweets, cameos from uh, Sanrio mascots and a giant <laughs> clown in the sky? They had to do the cameo. They had to do that, that one sequence where they're doing the Nutcracker. Well, th that's Hello part Kitty's the... got to jump out. It's just got to be in there. It's in the contract. Well, there's others as well, it's like um, the Twin Stars and the Strawberry mm -hmm. King, which are other lesser-known Sanrio mascot characters. But, I mean, that's part of the reason they made those films in the first place. Hello Kitty was created in 1974. These films were made in part on the back of that first initial wave of Hello Kitty money. Right. And it's I'm just pointing it out because they did the same thing in Unico, too, during the Katie the Kitty sequence. They also <laughs> had those characters pop up in the background. This is funny to me only because in my brain, I always think of Hello Kitty as being like 
from the 80s. I think just because, like, design-wise, it's like, this looks like something that was came out around the same time as, like, Strawberry Shortcake, surely. And it's well, like, no, it's like it's like a full well, decade older than that. Well, that's also because after Sanrio Films failed, they focused more on TV and on building up Hello Kitty as a brand. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. So the animated series that you may have seen, because I know it got uh, broadcast on Toon Disney during, like, the really weird hours of the night during the 2000s. That's definitely from that time period, so I can see why you'd think that. Well, it's also just, it has that it has that stink of, like, Ronald Reagan got rid of that law that meant you couldn't advertise, like, <laughs> toys for the show during the show, and, like, obviously that has no bearing on a Japanese product, but it has that aura about it. It probably had, it did have an impact on what was allowed to be broadcast, definitely. That's definitely true. <laughs> but... The, yeah, but Sanrio's uh, reputation for uh, Hello Kitty, unfortunately, in the public mind, kind of supersedes their more, uh, I guess we're going to say, darker, uh, more ambitious projects, which I definitely yeah. want to claim this mm. as, because... Oh, oh absolutely. Yeah. yeah, Megan, you asked me the question, would I be comfortable showing this to my kids? Because there's some imagery in it that's uh, acceptable for younger kids, but it's definitely not something that you would see in the most recent Disney movie, as an example. <laughs> Well, no, it starts off with this whole nightmare sequence about the Ragman, who's this boogeyman that turns kids who stay up too late into mice. I was and it comes out of nowhere! I and was, it goes nowhere! I was and that's the beginning of the film! <laughs> I was waiting the entire time for him to show up again, and he never does. He doesn't. It, it, it's, it, yeah, you're right. It's just, it's like, that was a thread that was maybe in the pre-production stages, but then they, they never developed it beyond, go to sleep, Clara. He never shows up again. Like, maybe you're supposed to imply that the kids he transforms are Morpheus minions, but I don't know. <laughs> you would think that, if that was true, you would think that there'd be, like, some connection between Morphia and the Ragman. Like, you'd see the two of them in cohorts together. Nope. It, so you're right. Nope. Just no. But, uh, but before we really get into the weirdness of uh, the movie, and, and the good stuff, too, because I'm going to argue there's some good stuff in it. Um, this is on a podcast called Dub Talk, and yes, this got a dub and a theatrical release, like a widespread American theatrical release. How did that happen, and is it any good? Well, let, let's use this opportunity to talk about who made this dub. And I don't know the answer to that, unfortunately. Um, I, I'm going to present to you guys, uh, and these guys are too, the information, the background information I could find out about this. Because unlike previous episodes we talked about where there's some history to the production his the, the production people or the Japanese people had connections that made that possible, in this situation here, it's kind of a big question mark. It's a lot of people, both famous and not famous, came together, made this dub, gave it a widespread theatrical release, but nothing really came out of it. So, who were those people? Well, let's talk about that. Starting with the ADR director. The ADR director for the Nutcracker Fantasies English dub was a gentleman by the name of Jack Woods, who had never done, and to this date has not done, any other ADR direction for dubbed over, uh, prelay production before. He's actually most well known as a sound and dialogue editor. Uh, not just for, like, low-grade B-movie stuff, he's actually done work for, like, really well-known stuff. Um, have you guys seen the movie Overboard by any chance? What, the, no. The, the Kurt Russell movie? Yes, the Kurt, yes, that one. Huh. That, or have you seen maybe Star Trek VI? <laughs> no, but good, I've heard of it. That's one of the good ones, right? Yeah. It, it, yeah, because it's an, uh, it's an odd, uh, it's an even-numbered movie. Uh, so yeah, he, but yeah, he is, uh, was sound editor for stuff like that. Um, none of those kind of films seem to have any connection to this particular production, so I don't know how he got roped into this. Neither do I really know how the scriptwriters got roped into this, because the adaptation credits for this uh, for this movie, for the English dub, go to two folks by the name of Eugene Fournier and Thomas Jochim, who I'm going to guess I'm not going to be able to find headshots for when I put the images for this episode together, because they have not really done very much. They have some bit credit writing for shows like WKRP in Cincinnati and Misadventures of Sheriff Lobo and acting as producers for a, I've never heard of this movie before, a 70s movie called Fraternity Row, which is something that 
doesn't seem to have any connection to Nutcracker Fantasy either. So, again, three folks who have work in writing and sound editing before, but not really, like, international releases of foreign products. Yeah, I can at least get some of the logic of getting a guy who works in sound editing to direct a dub. Like, th th there's a, a bit of a thread there, but... I, yeah. I, ha I have a suspicion. Especially because, as far as I know, like, this was not distributed by, like... As far as I know, this was not distributed by, like, some major, like, known studio. Like, I got the impression Sanrio was behind the release of this yes. themselves. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I'm I'm kind of guessing that they probably had some pre-existing contacts in LA from previous movie releases and just used those. Yes. That was like, find me people to work on this, basically. Uh, indeed, uh, yeah. because in uh, 1977, they produced a entirely American animated film called The Mouse and the Child. And that was oh. all, all done with um, American animators. No, that's right, because... <laughs> Spo no, spoiler alert, I... I, I looked on newspapers.com to try and look up reviews for this. They had an article with one of the American producers who helped bring this over who talked about, yeah, I got to working with Sam Rio because I worked on that movie with them. Yes. So yes, and in I, fact, I wanna... that's exactly where that came from. You're right. Yeah, so that that's what I mean when I say that uh, the, the connections in America are kind of how this got made. It's not like nowadays where you have uh, your G-Kids, your Shout Factories, your uh, Funimations and so forth who are exclusively looking to bring content like that over to america and they've already got a platform and a pre-made audience for it this was sanrio having to use their american uh, hollywood connections to get this into american theaters because it's not like someone in america was going to do it on their own dime mm -mm. i'm glad you brought up the producers too because i actually looked up who the producers were for the american release of this uh, there's three people credited as producers. Uh, one of them is Arthur Tomioka, who has no other credits to his name that I could find, unfortunately. Uh, but two of them who do have credits are kind of interesting. One of them is Walt DeFeria, who has a lot of film producer credits for, like, really family-friendly stuff going back all the way to the 60s. If you've seen anything he's worked on, it's probably the Borrower series, because he's a producer on everything related to that franchise from the early movies all the way to the recent era when Ghibli adapted it for um, The Secret World of Arietti. He's listed as a producer on that. Hmm. On the other side of it, you've got the third producer, Mark L. Rawson, who is a producer of much heavier stuff, uh, stuff that is not uh, family-friendly stuff, like the Ralph Bakshi movie Heavy Traffic. Or... <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, look, yeah, that's an animated film, sure, but uh, it's not uh, something I'd show at Christmas time. <laughs> well, actually, no, I, it, it depends on which audience, I think. We should get together and watch Heavy Traffic for Christmas. Oh, dear. We have the kids in one uh, room watching some Rankin Bass specials, and all the uncles go to another <laughs> room and watch the Ralph Bakshi movies. That's right. All right everyone grab your weed. We're going to listen to Simon and Garfunkel, watch a pinball machine, and watch some police brutality. <laughs> so... Yeah, the, that's the. Those are the people who I, I guess they balance each other out to uh, bring this kind of film to the big screen. And like you were saying, they they had worked on uh, that previous Sanrio production, so I guess they thought, well, we did that. I guess we're gonna we're gonna adapt this Nutcracker fantasy story too. Yeah, I was also gonna add that uh, they didn't actually make them, but Sanrio is also uh, heavily. Uh, uh, involved in producing a number of docu like family friendly documentaries and like low level family dramas like nothing you've e probably ever really heard of but they put their money into that so maybe that's that's another connection too mm. were those uh like doc uh, what time period did those documentaries come out the same period as Sanrio films itself late 70s early 80s okay so, so they were, again they're, it's so sad that they were so ambitious about breaking into the western sphere and it just never worked out. Crying shit. Aside from Hello Kitty. But when you so when you have um, a Japanese film and you need an English cast for it, you can go uh, one of three ways. One, you can get a no-budget fly-by-night studio who's going to get people to put a voice to it <laughs> and pray to God that someone's going to watch it. We've talked about that kind of production before. Um... You can do uh, the, the Unico thing where you get established voice actors, like for other animated features, 
and you, you know, you get them to do their cartoony thing and cater to the same audience that is, uh, yeah, is uh, watching television broadcasts or buying home video releases. Or you can do the third option, which is what uh, they did for this film. You can get celebrities. Yes, you can go what we're going to call the Disney Ghibli route, where you get big names to put on the poster and pitch the movie that way. Well, big names is comparatively speaking. I mean, mo most of the big cast names. here are seasoned, like, TV actors or character actors. Yeah, we're, 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 getting, we're getting the, the, the two-split divide of that particular brand, where you get, like, Disney money. And then you get, like, yeah, we can get Dick Van Patten. <laughs> He's not our <laughs> person this week. <laughs> yeah. And I'm glad we are, too, because uh, in, in what other podcast, in what other movie are we going to get to talk about, you know, beloved 70s television actors who've been in anything animated before? Indeed. Ex no. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, so I guess I should talk about who actually voices some of the characters, and um, the way that this is gonna work is uh, I'm just I'm got a list of like the most prominent characters uh, in the movie, um, and we can mention some of the other side characters as well if they get brought up. But I'm just gonna focus on like the main ones, the ones who are on this poster. I'm gonna put a picture up right here. This poster from when the movie first came out, where they actually pitched the movie based on some of these actors here. Like people would see their names and be like. Ah, I recognize them from Knott's Landing. I will go see this movie that they are in now. This not at all frightening poster. <laughs> Wait, uh, that that uh, 2D version of the, the the stop motion artwork. No, it's totally appealing. I wouldn't be terrified to show my kids that at all. It, it is funny how much of the advertising this movie focuses around Morphia, the single most horrifying <laughs> aspect. <laughs> Yeah, they well, weren't shying away from that at all. Kids love kids uh, love two headed rats. I mean, you're certainly not going to forget it. You're not going to mistake it for any other animated movie. So the okay, so we mentioned that uh, the story of Nutcracker Fantasy is based on a young girl by the name of Clara. Uh, Clara is voiced by Melissa Gilbert, and if you've heard that name before, I don't have to tell you what you've heard her in before. But if you haven't heard her before, you have still seen her before because she was probably the most famous child actor of the time period because she was Laura Ingalls in the television adaptation of Little House on the Prairie. And she'd done our stuff before. She'd been Helen Keller in a TV adaptation of The Miracle Worker. She was Anne Frank in a TV version of Diary of Anne Frank. And she recently ran for Congress here in my state of Michigan. Did not <laughs> succeed, but she tried. But you're probably going... This actually was dubbed in the same time period that they were making the show. So she is using her Laura voice for this particular character. Yeah, because this came out, like, right in the middle of what would end up being uh, Little House on the Prairie's, like... The middle of its run, like, its third or yep. fourth season. Yep, yep. Back but, uh, in the time period of the show where she was still a kid, where she had not become a school teacher, and she had not hooked up with... Um, what's his name yet? Alonzo. A lot, thank you. I've seen a lot of the show. I've seen a metric ton of Little House on the Prairie. That's like our fall asleep watching it kind of show. And I still can't remember Alfonso's <laughs> name for some reason. He's not very interesting. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I read the books, yeah. too. I read the, I read the books, but I still can't remember his name. Because you're right, he's not as interesting. Mary got a much more interesting guy. Um, speaking of getting together with a guy, uh, Melissa's, uh, I'm sorry, Clara's friend, at least in the English dub, is a gentleman by the name of Fritz, who is also playing the double duty of the soldier France in the, uh, in the dream sequences that she's experiencing, who is voiced by a gentleman by the name of Rhodey McDowell. Now, Rhodey McDowell is a name that you may not know, but if you know anything about, uh, like, 60s, 70s movie franchises, you may have heard of a series called Planet of the Apes before. And Rhodey was a big part of that franchise because he was the ape Cornelius in that franchise. Noah. Yeah, and that's Noah. kind of where his career peaked. Noah. <laughs> oh, what? R what? Roddy McDowell. It's Roddy. It is Roddy McDowell. I am saying it wrong. It is Roddy McDowell. I don't know why I say Rhodey. But yeah, he, he's very much just, I will do anything so long as you pay me. Along oh, with, you want... <laughs> oh, oh, 
Wait, I thought we meant to get Malcolm McDowell. No, we end up with Roddy McDowell. Oh, <laughs> that would have a very different movie. Yeah, to, to play off of that, he will do anything. Uh, to give a uh, indication of how far his career had kind of, uh, maybe not fallen, but plateaued in the years after Play of the Apes, he was doing the Disney Star Wars wannabe movie Black Hole a few years later as the voice of Vincent the... Uh, I don't know if I call it Robot Machine, but he was in Black Hole, basically, <laughs> which is a movie only one knows because it was Disney trying to do a Star Wars movie. Yeah, creepy. And failed. Yeah, creepy robot. That, yeah, there you go. Um, not to say he's done only creepy stuff. Like He, he was actually in uh, Batman, the animated series. He played the, the Mad Hatter in that series. He, he... Uh, he was also in Fright Night. Fright Night. Yes, he was. He was, um, he was. What's it? Peter Vincent, that's it. That's right. So, so, yeah, I don't want to say that Planet of the Apes was, like, the pinnacle of his career or anything. It's just the thing that most people are going to know him he, for. He, he's very much a dude who is a perennial, like, character actor, TV actor. and never quite broke through to being, like, a leading man type. Right. He's just, I mean, he's lucky. Uh, most actors of the time period don't have, like, one definitive role that uh, people point to as theirs. So he's lucky that he has that in his filmography. Now, someone who does have a lot of films attached to their name, and we could talk about for three hours, is uh, the character of Uncle Drosselmeyer. And yes, that is a reference. For those of you who've seen Princess Tutu, you know what that's a reference to. But he is uh, not just Clara's uncle, he's also a clockmaker. And, uh, well, they needed to give him a very refined voice. And they decided to go for the most refined voice that you can get. And I do mean that sincerely. They got Christopher Lee to voice Uncle Drosselmeyer in this movie. Christopher if, freaking <laughs> Lee! If and any it's of awesome! You need to name any roles he's been in before, then I'm sorry, you're just you're listening to the wrong podcast. You should know who Christopher Lee is before. You've seen Lord of the Rings. You've seen uh every uh maybe not all the Hammer Horror movies, but you've seen him as Dracula. You've seen Willy Wonka and the Ch Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. You've seen Christopher Lee before, people. Yeah, he had literally had hundreds of roles to his name before he died, like four or five hundred. That yes, it's insane. The man did not stop acting. Just to tie it back to another uh, Rankin Bass production, even though this isn't a Rankin Bass production, he was in the Last Unicorn. He was King Indeed. Haggard in that movie. It's all connected, guys. So yeah, we got Christopher freaking Lee in this movie. Yes, we will gush about that in a bit here. We're, we should also gush a bit about uh, the character of Aunt Gerda, who is actually not Clara's aunt in the original Japanese. In the original Japanese, she is a nurse. Uh, she's like a, a housekeeper, nurse, maid, nanny kind of character. Mm -hmm. uh, but for some reason in the English dub, they decided to change her into an aunt, which is fine. It doesn't really change the plot too much. But she is voiced in the English dub by a lady by the name of Lorene Tuttle. Now, you may have seen her in... Psycho, the Alfred Hitchcock movie, because uh, she plays Mrs. Chambers in that. Uh, but that's not really what she's known for. Um, she was actually one of the most prolific radio actors for decades, like starting in the 40s and all the way into when radio stopped being a thing. Uh, she was in, uh, she was like every female character in a series called Adventures of Sam Spade. She was like, she was just really well known. She was essentially the uh, the June foray of the radio drama series for decades and decades. So she had a lot of experience doing voice work before doing this movie. And she didn't have a lot of TV credits, but it seems like it's like, we need like a busybody, stern mom or like neighbor lady or something like that. Get Lurleen Tuttle. And it's, you're right. And it's interesting that uh, for all the voice work that she did, she doesn't have that much uh, animation credits. Like she didn't really transition into voiceover in the later parts of her career, at least not prominently. So it's, I find that kind of interesting. Who I also find kind of interesting is an actor that, from a show that I've never heard of before, but it sounds like Amon's heard of this before. Uh, when we get into the fantasy world, we meet a character named King Goodwin, who is, I think he's a king. I wouldn't call him that if he wasn't the king. Yes. And he, he is voiced by a gentleman by the name of Dick Van Patten. Now, I sorry, I have not heard of him before. And I, um, that's also because uh, it's been a while since I've seen my Mel Blanc movies, because uh, he was in Spaceballs, he was King Roland, 
Yep. Uh, he was in Robin Hood Men in Tights. He was the yep. abbot in that movie. Um, and he was also in Freaky Friday. Th- not the not the Lindsay Lohan one, but the original one from the 60s. He played a character of Harold in that movie. Uh, but according to Amon, that's not where most people would have heard of him before. Where, where, where is he well, from? My understanding is if you know him for something, he was the lead on a uh, 80s sitcom called Eight is Enough, where he was the patriarch of a large family with eight children. Um, like, I think that's, like, at least if you're old enough to have seen that, that is probably the thing you would be familiar with him from, because that ran for, like, six mm-hmm. or seven years or something like that. So it was the Loud House of its yes, day. I know him from a very, very obscure joke from a book I like. Because <laughs> I've never actually watched Eight is Enough. I don't think that was on the air by the time I was old enough to watch TV. Fair. Would you like, did you know he has a dog food brand? I did not. <laughs> okay. If you, go, if you go to a store and you see Natural Balance, if you look really hard at the top of the logo, it says Dick Van Patten's because he founded it. Well, well, I guess he's, he's got to do something between all the, the various minor TV and movie roles he's done over the decades. He's gotta, he's, mm-hmm. He's himself busy. Or did. If Paul Newman can make his own salsa, <laughs> I guess Dick Van Patten can make his own dog food. <laughs> well? For a while, he was on the label, so yes. I, I believe you. That's not the brand I buy. I, I would like to stop this episode to plug our sponsor... Uh, blue brand dog food, actually. Yes, uh, blue dog food. The high quality, uh, more expensive stuff that you only get if you love your fur pet. Yes, blue brand dog food. Sponsoring the best of fur pets that you could possibly own. And now back to the podcast. The, uh, yeah, so the inclusion of Dick Van Patten in this gives us a chance to talk about TV actors that are, were known at their time. Maybe not so to the modern generation. But the modern generation definitely knows the next person I'm going to talk about. At least if you know anything about your Disney movies from the 70s. And that is the Queen of Time, who is not only an interesting character, an interestingly animated character. Because she's the only character in the movie who is not stop motion. She is like Chinese puppet animated. That's why her movements look really fluid and honestly a little creepy. But I think she's supposed to be, so it works out. Oh, she's supposed to be a marionette then. I couldn't tell. I thought it was like somebody in a costume with like yeah. a, a mask. Yeah, I, I wondered that too. Like but a hand puppet mask. I mean, it looks like it's it's definitely uh, moved uh, in real time. And there's sequences where it's interacting with the Clara puppet who is not moving at all. It's like Clara is static while Queen of Time is moving. So I'm pretty sure it's not like a person in a costume. So if it's not a marionette, it may be hand puppet style, but it's it's definitely way different from all the other characters that were animated in this movie. But anyway, who is she? Well, she is voiced by Ava Gabor. And you have definitely heard her before because Ava Gabor plays Bianca in The Rescuers and Duchess in The Aristocats. Um, and now, people who maybe are more on the TV watching side of things probably know her more for her role in Green Acres. Uh, She played the character of Lisa Douglas in that series, which is a show that I've heard of before. I haven't actually seen it, but it sounds like a a fun, uh, wacky, comedy of errors kind of show along the lines of the Beverly Hillbillies, which aired along the same time period. It's great. Yep. Made by a lot of the same people. Amon and I are old enough to have seen some of it in syndication. And yeah, it's... it's a silly little 60s sitcom. Da 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 da. The chores. Da, 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 da. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a little weirder, maybe, than uh, Beverly Hillbillies, only that I do remember there's one episode that starts with, like, uh, she comes out of the house to talk to her husband, and she, like, notices, like, the title card of the episode, and she's like, Albert, what was that? And they, like, just keep seeing the credits, and it's like, why are there letters in our yard? <laughs> they pulled a Muppets most want, or a Muppets great caper on the opening credits? 60s TV was weird, man. You could get away with a lot of silly stuff and no one would really bat an eye at it. That's great. I gotta hunt that down now. That sounds awesome. So yeah, we got Ava Gabor in this movie. Alright, I've talked about quite a few um, actors who I've never heard of before uh, who also haven't done a whole lot of other voice work. But one other character who uh, has definitely done quite a bit of voice work before is the voice of Queen Morphia herself. Yes, the two-headed demon rat character who acts as our primary antagonist and is just having an absolute ball, just having the fabulous most time ever. 
That character is voiced by Joe Ann Worley, who you have all heard before, going back to Disney movies. She's probably most well known to this generation for playing uh, the armoire in Beauty and the Beast, uh, the one who has the dresses inside of her and who says, um, you know, um, what shall we get you in for dinner? <gasps> Let's see what I got in my drawers. <laughs> oh, so embarrassing. I love her voice so much. Um, like, I, I didn't know that I knew her before, but I saw one credit that she done before. You guys saw the cartoon Kim Possible before, yeah. right? Yes. In one episode, they go to a ski lodge, and the character of Bonnie's mom shows up. This is the only episode that she shows up in. She has maybe five lines, but she is so over the top. She's all like, I heard you needed more chaperones, so I just rushed right over. And as soon as I heard that she was in that episode, I'm like, I totally remember who she is now. No wonder that she does a lot of voice work because she's got a very distinct, very over-the-top, very infectious voice to her, which is exactly what she brings to this character in this movie. And at the time this movie came out, even though it, it ended many years previously, people still would have known her for being one of the main cast members of Laugh-In, the seminal 60s comedy show. Mm -hmm. She was, and I'm glad you brought that up, uh, that you brought Laugh-In up, because uh, one one thing that I found in trying to research, like, how did they get this particular cast of actors together for this, is that in the credits, one of the, ca one of the things that's credited is celebrity coordinators is credited to a company named Mary Markham and & Associates. And I looked up what they'd done before. Turns out that they had done similar things of bringing just cast members together for shows, for things like Laugh-In and the Donnie and Marie show. So whatever, whoever was coordinating this had connections to people in LA who were, I guess, either really well-known for TV stuff, like dramas, or like you were saying, Laugh-In, uh, variety shows, the kind of stuff before Saturday Night Live existed. Yep, mm -hmm. that, that, suddenly this casting makes yeah, a lot that, more that, sense. It's like, it, this, is, this, is, this is like the, this is the Rosetta Stone that it's like, oh. <laughs> now I understand how this came about. I get it now. Yes, that, that's the only thing I can imagine, because like we said, it's not like an American studio really wanted this movie, but God damn it, they got uh, Joanne Worley in the cast for it. And rounding this out, we're going to finish this off with the character of the narrator, which is another interesting addition for the dub, because the narrator is framed as an older version of Clara who interjects throughout the movie to just kind of exposit some thoughts that weren't in the original Japanese because as far as I can tell from the original Japanese there is no narrator character there is a voice at the beginning of the movie kind of explaining about the ragman but it's not framed as being Clara it, the the lines about uh this is a story from my past uh this is my memory of the time when my doll was stolen and oh by the way there's a two-headed mouse creature none of that was in the Japanese so this is kind of a complete invention of the dub side of things and to fill that void for the narrator we have the one and only Michelle Lee do either of you guys have heard of Michelle Lee before no I, I am I am vaguely familiar with the thing you're about to cite as the famous thing she was in Okay, well, I'm glad you are, because I have not really seen Knott's Landing, but she was a character of Karen in that show. Um, she also had bit parts on shows like the uh, Laugh In, so that's another connection uh, that we were talking about before. Um, maybe you've seen the special Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer, <laughs> maybe? Are you fucking serious? I think so. <laughs> well, good, because she plays the bit character of Cousin Mel in that seminal holiday special which you know ties it all okay. back into the christmas theme we were going for Dear before Lord. <laughs> has nothing to do with this particular movie but yes she she was uh very well known in tv at the time period so she brings her karen voice to this movie so yeah she was famous but she's soap opera famous which is a different sort of famous oh yep. that is that's it true is. but <laughs> it's you're right. Like, I can't name it. C can you guys name any, like, famous soap operas that are on today? Oh, I have no. Any any soap operas I remember are the ones that, like, my babysitter watched in the early to mid-90s. Like, I'm not, I don't think you have those. Even <laughs> Same here. Anymore. I think The Young and the Restless might still be running, but that that's a big 
I yes. Think. Yes, because I had co-workers who would tune into it. <laughs> really? Oh, even better. Oh, you know what Knott's Landing is? I, not really, it, sorry. Aside from a soap it's opera? It's a spinoff from Dallas. Yeah. Oh. oh, so it, ha it has soap opera pedigree. Yeah, you know, I, I was. You, you hear about everything gets a sequel or a spinoff or a reboot nowadays. Appar that's not a new thing. They, uh, apparently, they've been doing that forever. Oh, yeah. One of these days, people look up uh, where Family Matters came from. Because that was also a spinoff. Wasn't Family Matters but like a perfect stranger spinoff? Yes, it was. Very I good. I that recently, because uh, Bronson Pinchot <laughs> was on a podcast I like. Anyways, we're getting off topic again. Yes. <laughs> no, it's okay. That's what this whole thing's about. But, yeah, so we've talked about who's in the cast here. Um, I'm going to assume that you guys have thoughts about the how all these actors uh, turned in their performances for this movie. Uh, Megan, would you like to tell us what you thought? Oh, well, to begin with, well, Melissa Gilbert and Roddy McDowell sure were there they were Aww. present i Aww. hate to say it because people did love melissa gilbert she seems like a nice lady and people loved her in little house in the prairie but she's not a voice actress no no she's not she's she's kind of flat and she's kind of the weak link in the movie which is really bad when you're the protagonist well i i mean i'm not gonna harsh on her too much mostly because i can't like i said i've seen a lot of little house on the prairie so <laughs> I can't unhook the voice that she's giving in this from, you know, memories of, aw, she got cheated out of her horse, or, aw, she's, uh, you know, just trying to help her dad get by. Why, why don't they ever have any good luck on that show? But you're right, it's not, it's not that she's really good at uh, conveying the angry and exasperated parts of the character. I think she's okay at, like, the standard young girl uh, voice in some scenes, but when things get more difficult and Clara's got to be more exasperated, I do feel that Melissa doesn't quite know what to do or maybe wasn't directed in those scenes very well. I think that's reasonable. Like, I, I do appreciate that they got, like, a child actress rather than had, like, an adult woman do a child voice because you can, even when it's well mm -hmm. done, you can tell, like, ah, this is an adult playing a child. Um, and yeah. like, I, I think some of that, some of that quality comes through, but yeah, like I, I, I feel like there are, yeah, there are definitely parts where like more acting would have been necessary. And I feel like she either didn't know, yeah, she didn't know what she was doing or she wasn't being directed very well in the scene. Um, probably not help that obviously she is the only child in the cast. And I'm, I'm sure, I think a lot of the, Jack Woods probably had to massage the adults a little less, especially the ones mm -hmm. who had, you know other experience in voice acting or radio or have you and i think he may have been a little ill-equipped to deal with like i mean how old was she what does she have been when she was making this like 10 or something 12 or 13 yeah like that's yeah in her yeah like young enough that she probably would need more help compared to some of the other like you know people who've been acting for decades on end so She's like, mm -hmm. i thought she was like okay but like I, I think a lot of that was just that it was clearly like an actual child playing this character rather than like uh, an adult and yeah, Roddy think... McDowell is mostly there just to be kind of serious and British, and <laughs> it, it's a character that really needed somebody more dashing. Yeah, R R Roddy McDowell does a perfectly fine job being very noble and a cute boy. He nails, he nails that, that part he... of the character. Everything else, you can't. I mean, I'm not gonna. It's not like he had much to work with because I, th I think true. he counted that he's got like five and a half lines in the whole thing. Most of it is mostly just standing stalwartly and explaining we're going to use this pearl sword to defeat the evil queen. So it's not like he had a whole lot of content to work with. Yeah, this, this felt like something where he was kind of undone by a character who is, I think, on ten intentionally kind of thin. Like he, uh, Amon, huh? did, you, did, you watch the, uh, did you watch the Japanese of this by any chance? I watched... I did. I, I, I ended up watching a few clips, kind of see what was different, but I did not sit down and watch the whole thing all the way through. Okay, because in the in the original, Fritz is not Clara's friend; she's her He's cousin. Her cousin. <laughs> they are related, and she's in love. And that makes the ending a lot more awkward than I think they wanted in the American version. 
Yeah, the notably, that's one of the things they kind of edited out. Like, they edited out some reaction scenes, and they definitely changed the dialogue to make it more friendly. But no, mm -hmm. it, it's more intimate. Like, she has a crush on her cousin Fritz, who just graduated college, which would therefore put him in his early 20s. Age is just a number, and so is a jail cell. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they play. They played up the whole in the Japanese. They played up the whole that uh, their house is. Uh, it's like their royalty or whatever the aristocracy. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, because they've got a housemaid. Clara is as referred to as Lady Clara by the Aunt Gerda character, um, and of course the cousin is coming in from university, which was kind of reserved for the prestigious upper elite of the time period. So, in going to what the scriptwriters did, it sounded like they wanted to make. The characters, at least the human characters, a little more human, a little more pedestrian, I guess. So they, they scrubbed the aristocracy element away, which included making Fritz just a, a friend instead of a cousin. And, and yeah. that's fine. It's, it's not a huge deal. And I should note, in the in the sub, it's it's not as pervy as you, you might be thinking compared to, like, modern anime and how it treats yeah. cousins. I'm, I'm imagining just a lot of very much, like... <laughs> Uh, uh, oh, it's an attractive older man, and she's just kind of mooning over it in the way that, like, kids right. do. Like, it's yeah. very innocent. Innocent schoolgirl crush. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but, yeah, I'm not going to hold too much against Rhodey here, because, like I said, he doesn't have too much to do. But it, it's not like I wouldn't disagree with you guys about we could get a more dashing uh, character in here. We could uh, we could get a Chris Patton or something like that in this voice cast, definitely. Go back to my Princess once, Tutu references. Once, once again, I once again I am. We are watching a Sanrio movie where I'm like, the guy playing the royal character should be more like a Utena person. <laughs> That's right. That's <laughs> right. Watch, watching this, it's like I don't. I'm not super familiar with the kind of like the exact story beats that Utena is riffing on, but probably he's like, ah, oh, this is this is definitely the princely type they're talking about in that show, isn't it? It's this guy. Yes. This it is, is who they're talking about. We, we didn't have an equivalent to this in America. We still really don't. Really? So, yeah. Or when you do, when you we, do we it's some stuff that is, like, inspired by anime, and that's what they're riffing on in the first place. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, they are. In, in comparison, uh, the rest of the cast fare is a lot better, but that's a lot because a lot of them are professional character and voice actors. They either yes. have voices with more personality in general, or they know how to work with what they're given. Yeah, and um, I, I want to hold Christopher Lee up like more towards the end, if that's okay, because <gasps> okay. I, I know I know we're gonna gush about that. So let let me just talk a little bit about the King. If we could talk about Dick Van Patten's performance of the King, because I that's like kind of a good example of what you were talking about with uh, people who have uh, more interesting voices that can elevate a standard character, even if they're not voice actor people. Right. I, I like what he does with that role. He he managed to, you know, summon some sort of authority, but he's also really good in the more dramatic moments where he's sad about his daughter, Princess Mary, being under this curse. Yeah, he adds a little bit of stuffiness uh, to, to make him sound more royal, a little more older, but he also uh, is, like, convincing sadness without being flat, which is kind of hard to do. Like, you can sound sad and morose and really downtrodden like this, but you can also have... The kind of sad where it's weighing on you and it's burdening you. And that I feel like that's what Dick is portraying in this character, which makes it more elegant than just a sad dad archetype. Mm. Yeah. He also serves as a good contrast to his Chamberlain, who we did not bring up earlier, uh, who is voiced by a guy named Ken Sampson. And oh, you yeah. might not know him by name, but if you're a child of the 80s or later and you grew up with Disney, particularly Winnie the Pooh, you know his voice. And you'll know it the moment he opens his mouth because he's the voice of Rabbit. The second voice, admittedly, but he played him from like the 80s until like 2010. Hey, I, I, yeah, I watched the hell out of that Pooh cartoon whenever it was on. That was like my favorite thing when hell I was yeah. a child. That, that cartoon was also messed up. Like, if you go back and watch some of those episodes, they get sucked under a bed into, like, a vacuum cleaner monster. They have an existential crisis about popping balloons. Like, goddamn, you can see the, like, darker elements of that show all over the place. So, yeah, that was that was just kind of a pleasant surprise. Yeah, yeah to have that Disney voice, uh, or at least famous Disney related voice in the middle of this uh, celebrity cast list extravaganza. 
Uh, was I, I was also surprised by this because like I had, I, had, I I'm like familiar vaguely with Dick Van Pam, but I've not really watched any things he's in. So I looked up like I think it was an interview on like the Tonight Show that he was in, and it's like the voice he uses here is not at all what he actually sounds like. Like he is, yeah. he is he is noticeably like creating a voice for this character, which is not what I was expecting from him, based on literally any photo I've ever seen from him. Like he looks like a football coach. <laughs> <laughs> Like good for like he did a good job. I liked it. It just it was like, uh, this is good. I like this. Thank you, Mister Van. Yeah, that, and that. Well, that, that uh, that's again a good um, testament to how well uh, Jack Woods did in like this one solo ADR directing kind of thing, because like whatever his style was, it at least was able to get uh, actors to portray characters that is kind of unlike what they'd done before. Someone else uh, I also thought was surprisingly good, Joanne Worley. Oh, yeah. Because when she is usually she's cast the... as a voice actress, uh, it's usually in very broad comedic roles because that's yes. what she's known for. But here she's the villain, and she's great. She's the best. I, I think she's the best character, uh, the best actor in the entire movie. She's good. I think, I, I feel like the, I feel like the, I feel like the through lines through a lot of her roles is I feel like like we need brassy comes to mind yeah, like I, yeah. I, I looked up a few laughing clips and it's very clear like there's was it, there's some bit where she's like what the hell's his name who's jim rockford james gardner was like the guest and there's like a whole skit where she's like <laughs> hitting like hitting on him and trying to get him to come back to her house after the show oh and yeah it's like yeah no this this, this makes like... this makes sense like she she clearly has just like a, she's good big she's good at playing like big personality heavy characters and i can definitely see why the, like they would cast her for this because it's like all right you're an evil queen in a fairy tale have fun <laughs> yeah it, brass brassy is a good description because i listening to her performance i was reminded almost a little bit of phyllis diller although she's not as oh, broadly yeah. comedic as phyllis diller mm -hmm. but she, she still manages to exude like i don't want to say scariness that's that's a bit much but She's she's definitely a little rougher than she usually is uh, in her voiceover mm. roles, and she gets to play up the campy elements too because you can't take the designs of the character very seriously. And even though the the animation and the lightning and smoke effects and everything from the visual arts department makes the character intimidating, she brings a joyful glee to her menace that I feel like uh, elevates the character to almost a Disney villain status. The kind of thing that we would see from characters like Ursula in, you know, years after this movie had come out. You're not wrong. Now, I remember, Aman, uh, back a long time ago, a whole year ago, when we covered um, Porco Rosso, you'd mentioned that uh, you weren't really familiar with Susan Egan because she's more of a stage mm -hmm. person. So even though you knew her, you just you hadn't really seen much of what she'd done before. Yep. I kind, of, I kind of feel like that's what I also feel about Joanne Worley, because she's got a lot of stage credits to her name as well. She doesn't have as many, like, big-name voiceover roles or uh, modern movie uh, roles to her name. But when you see her, like, when she does pop up, it's just a joy to hear. Yeah, she's great. You know what else is great? What? Ava Gabor. <laughs> She's all right. The the modulation they put on her voice is doing a lot of work, but she she was always the better actress of the Gabor sisters. Yeah, I, I, she does fine. I, I don't know anything about Jaja -Ja Gabor. I, I don't have seen many my, of her performances, so I can't. My knowledge judge. of Jaja -Ja Gabor is she slapped a cop once, and she was on Batman. 66. Okay, so oh, scratch that. This is the extent of I don't even know anything about the middle Gabor sisters. So like, she's got a foot up on her. <laughs> They were uh -huh. hot and Hungarian. That's all anybody yeah, needed I, to know back yeah, then. I feel, I feel, I feel like half the reason she has a filter on her voice is because they're trying to flatten out her accent, which she never really like tried to dispose of during her life. So it was, no. it was an interesting choice. Well, I feel like the, they actually do lay on the the Hungarian accent uh, more in this, at least compared to like her more well known Disney roles or uh, the Green Acres performance. And I think that's because, uh, like you were saying, Megan, they, they kind of put a modulation on her voice and they tell her to draw out her words. It's like it takes her longer to say a word than most of the other characters because she's supposed to be this otherworldly, um, almost fortune teller kind of character with a very creepy animation style. Yes. <laughs> Again, I, de 
it, it made me remember that um, the the actual director of this movie, like the Japanese director, um, is a gentleman by the name of Takeo Nakamura, who uh, was an uh, he worked on some of those uh, Rankin Bass uh, productions under Tahito uh, Mochinaga. And he was actually versed in Chinese puppetry. He had gotten his start learning stuff, uh, kind of the techniques that would later become known to people in stuff like, um, uh, what's that one puppet show that uh, Urobuchi's working on right now? Thunderbolt Thunderbolt Fantasy? Fantasy? Thunderbolt Fantasy, yeah, that. I'm pretty sure that those same techniques are what's being applied to the character of the Queen of Time here, because it feels like the kind of thing you'd see in a Chinese puppet production. Mm. I, I don't know. I still think it's it's a person in a costume kind of operating a puppet head because the shoulders and arms are kind of the proportions are off that in a way that makes me think a person. Also, her hands move because she, she has a yeah. crystal ball that she strokes and her, yeah. her hand movement is very natural. It's not puppety for lack of better phrase. Maybe uh, there's a possibility that they did both. Like uh, for the close up shots, they may have done person in costume. And then for, like, um, the wider shots where, like, they've got to have the Clara doll in the shot, they may have done the marionette portion. So it's maybe we're remembering different parts of the overall actor's performance. I really wish someone would write a book on the baking of this movie because I there, there yes. are partially because it's interesting and partially because between this and the bit with the actual ballet dancers, I'm just curious to know, like... <sighs> Were these, like, conscious artistic decisions, or were you just running out of money towards the end of production <laughs> and needed to <laughs> no, do I, things? No, I, I, I know a little bit about uh -huh. that, and I think it was a conscious effort on Shinshiro Suji's part. Mm -hmm. Like, his whole thing with these films is, like, I'm going to bring in all this world-class talent and show mm -hmm. it off. And e even with those these ballet sequences, because there's a couple points in the film where everything stops dead and we have a little bit of ballet. And sometimes they mm -hmm. even, like, do a split screen where, like, Clara does like a little pirouette with with the ballerina and yep. that ballerina was actually known uh her name is y yuko morishita uh okay. you can find if you look on look her up on youtube you'll find uh images of her like dancing with rudolf nuriev mm -hmm. in the 80s all right wow uh, sh she did a lot of like uh performances in china and in fact um uh the pas oh, de deux she does in the uh, second half of the film her partner there I'm trying to remember his name. It's like Tetsuro Shinisu or something like that. Uh, not only is he her husband, uh, he is the head of the ballet company she was with. And he himself is the son of the founder of said ballet company and its first principal dancer. Dang. Okay. See, I, I hear that you explaining that they're trying, that uh, Shintaro was trying to bring in like world-class performers for the highest production movie. And yet all I'm thinking of when I see world-class ballet performer contrasted with stop motion Clara puppet is this is like a Sesame Street sequence this is like where they take <laughs> a really great performer and put them up with the puppet for children and yes I know this was a, intended for a family audience but it's like I don't see the highest use of uh, world class ballet performers here I see padding sequence with uh, stop motion dolls because we think it looks cool well, there's nothing neat. wrong with a little bit of roll of cool. I think the only reason I'm disappointed is it's like, it would have been nice if they could have stopped motion the ballet. And then it occurred to me, it's like, that would have been so complicated. I know. You know what? Yes. Oh, you mean like, uh, like, like stop motion the, the actual ballerinas in live no, action? No, I'm like, like when I, like when I initially saw this, my, one of my first thoughts was like, was this like uh footage, was this reference footage for a stop oh. motion ballet sequence that they then abandoned for basically being too difficult to do with the technology at the time? I don't know, but I could totally see that as a possibility. I mean, the, the, fo the footage looks a little too intentional to be like test footage. That was kind of like my first, my first thought when watching it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If that makes sense. Okay. I'm, I'm glad you weren't recommending that they puppet motion the actors because the, that style, that, that that's an animation style called pixelization where you take a live actor and you move them bit by bit to make them look stop motion. Oh, you mean like, you mean like the Sledgehammer video? Like the Sledgehammer video and like um, uh, th there's a stop motion version of The Adventures of Tom Thumb which does that. It never doesn't look creepy. But I like it when it looks creepy. It's okay for some... I mean, it depends on the tone you're going for. This movie, I don't think, was going for that no. tone. I don't think this movie was trying to be Sledgehammer. <laughs> no, it's think... just like, we need some ballet because people know this is a ballet, and it kind of adds to the, the dreaminess of the whole yeah. thing. 
Yes, it does. And and to be fair, it is incredibly good uh, yeah. dancing. Like, if you appreciate good ballet, you will absolutely appreciate this. And I really like where they uh, take the footage of her, and they have uh, four of her side by side, and then they, like, kind of come together gradually to give, like, this dizzying effect of multiple dancers uh, in sync with each other. Where was I going with this? Um, <laughs> let's see, there's one more um, perform. Oh, uh, yeah, um, so... We, uh, we should probably also talk about the narrator um, about uh, Michelle Lee's performance because, like I said, she gets kind of more screen time, quote-unquote, than was in the original Japanese because they didn't really have a narrator in the Japanese version. Yeah, and this kind of comes back to the way this was adapted. It's th the way this dub was written, it it's very much trying to hold the kid's hand and leave as little quiet time as little dead space as possible and yes. a big part of that is michelle lee's role as the narrator like any sequence where clara is just kind of wandering along not speaking her thoughts we better explain this to the kids or they might get bored yeah they did that not just with the narration but um they actually added sound effects um there's a, a credit in the uh the version that's on uh country roll that lists uh dubbing studio not just for dubbing but also for adding sound effects in and if you compare the two, um, it's like sequences where there was maybe quieter sound effects in the Japanese, like the mice or some of the action sequences. They ramp them up more in the English version of it. So you're right. They were definitely trying to fill in any quiet moments with as much either narration or sound effects as possible. Although, luckily, Michelle's uh, voice is very pleasing to listen to. It's like a it very is. nice mm -hmm. uh, storybook atmosphere for the film. And it, it's not out of place. It's it's definitely the kind of, I'm going to lull you into this fantasy world where, um, you know, we have to suspend our disbelief for moving puppets and fantasy creatures. So it helps bridge that gap between when you start the movie and transitioning into that. Yeah, she does have a nice voice, and she's not overbearing. They don't add too much narration to the point where it starts to feel a little intellectually insulting. Mm hmm. And yeah, we've seen that before. Um, if you've ever seen the, um, uh, let's see, the, the theatrically released version of The Thief and the Cobbler. Oh, boy. That's, that's a movie where way too much narration was added into a movie that really didn't need it. <laughs> <sighs> Poor Richard Williams. He deserved better. Yeah. Um, did, I, did we skip anyone? Uh, we I don't think uh, we, uh, yeah, we... we I don't think... I think that's about everyone. So, final thoughts. I, I know that's everyone. Well, uh, There's nothing left uh, of my no, no, castle. Hey, hey, so hey, hey, hey. No, no, no. Because I, I would right. like to talk... I would All like to talk right. about Lorene Tuttle. Because, again, Aunt Gerda, or AKA the nursemaid, in the Japanese, not only is a bit of a lesser role, she, she's mostly just a very fussy old lady. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I like the sass Lorene Tuttle brings to it. She, she's more of a, a little more of a stern, go to bed kind of, kind of parental figure. Yeah, they, they mm -hmm. and, and part of, and part of this obviously they rewrote it so that she's like uh, Claire's relative and not just like you know some employee of the house. But you, I feel like you get a good sense <laughs> of like, no, th these two actually have like a relationship together, and it's you're like, go to yeah. bed, Clara, or the boogeyman will get you. <laughs> yeah, her relationship with Claire, or even her uh, interplay with Drosselmeyer, like just kind—I of, I don't want to say she's like a nagging wife, but she kind of is. I, I put that down. I put she's a convincing nag, and it, I mean that in the nicest way possible. But she, yeah, it is just what the way that she voices her. Uh, you know, like why isn't our clock working yet? <laughs> and if you've ever been married or had a relative or had a significant other who's asked you to do something. And you're like, I'll get to it when I get to it, and they don't let up on it. You know that interaction before. I, I know, Jennifer. I know I need to fix the toilet. I will get it fixed when I figure <laughs> out how to do it. I, I had forgotten about that scene, and I did really enjoy being like, Oh, Mr. Hotshot, clockmaker. I can't help but notice the clock we asked you to fix is still broken. Would you like to do something about it? It was. She was very good at that. I like that. It, and it carries a different weight uh, in the original because if you you've got a uh, I suppose a employee of the house telling one of the people who essentially employs her that hey there's something that you need to fix that that's some uh, that's some brass balls on a, a hired person essentially 
Well, in the Japanese, she's not nagging him about fixing the clock in the house. They're talking more about him fixing the big clock in town. Oh, okay. Oh. I, I, I missed that. I'm sorry. I, yeah, because the, the subs, I must have missed that part. I thought she was talking about the clock in their house. I, I think it's brought up, but not as much as it is in the dub. Hmm. But speaking of the clockmaker, <sighs> it's time. All right, all right. Oh, it's sorry. time. Let me, let me, uh, hold on. Let me just get my, uh, let me get my fanboy shirt on a second here. Okay, let me get my Christopher Lee fanboy shirt. All right. So, who wants to talk about world-class, not-to-killer, wizard, extraordinaire, Christopher Lee? Do you want to go first or should I? I, I want you to go first. I, I, I will admit I'm very biased here because... When we did the 1001 a Nights episode, remember how uh, Amon kept talking about all those Giallo movies <laughs> that the, the Italian yeah. actors had been and knew them really well? That's yep. me with like 50s, 60s European gothic horror. So I'm very familiar with the filmography of Christopher Lee, and I'm a very big fan of his. And he is by far the best performance in this dub. He definitely sounds like he's having the most fun. Yes, and... <laughs> I mean, for someone who was typecast for so long as just this stern, villainous personality, he gets to be whimsical here. He gets to sing more than yes. once. Tick, tick, and, he has, tick. and he has this lovely bass voice, and it's a shame he didn't get to sing more in his lifetime. I mean, other than things like weird novelty heavy metal records. <laughs> what? Th oh, that was a oh, thing. Oh, are you not familiar with the heavy metal albums Christopher Lee made? I mean, it doesn't sound out of place, so it, it's not like it surprises me, but that sounds like the kind of thing that someone would, like, like joke about, like, um, Christopher Lee is, um, uh, is a world-class art thief, he's also a literal vampire, uh, and he <laughs> writes heavy metal music. So when you say that that's actually a thing, like, something I can go out and listen to, yes. I'm, I'm just like, give me the link, and I will listen to that. Let's see if I can dig it up for you. Also, he wasn't an art thief, he was a spy, get it right. That's right, he was in the SAS. But we don't know if he wasn't an art thief. He could have been. <laughs> you know what? You know what? Fair <laughs> point. <laughs> but yes, uh, and he does actually a, a lot of uh, double duty, because not only is he Drosselmeyer, uh, he is a, a street singer, he's a puppeteer, and he's a clockmaker, but all, all of the qualities that these characters have in common is that they're all these characters who are kind of guiding Claire along through this dream world, a uh, kind of along her journey to help the Nutcracker. Mm -hmm. It's more apparent um, in the scene where he's a puppeteer and he's like looking under the glass at the character of Franz who's been turned into a Nutcracker doll that, oh, this is the same voice of the, of the Uncle Drosselmeyer character, at least in the English. I don't know if it was uh, supposed to be as apparent in the Japanese, uh, it's, they kind of pulled a Wizard of Oz thing where, you know, characters in the real world are have reflective counterparts in the fantasy sequence of it. But it fits to have him be that character in the dream sequence. Well, I mean, that's that's always been Drosselmeyer's world, going back to the original E.T.A. Hoffman story upon which yes. this is based. Mm. Drosselmeyer is this character who kind of stands between these, the real and dream world. Yeah, and his uh, delivery here is... I. I I have to wonder, like, did he audition for this, or did they see him in something, like, they saw Christopher Lee in a performance, one of his 500 performances, and thought he'd be perfect for this, because whatever it was, he's absolutely fitting for an older, eccentric, but still lovable character that is... I, I still think Joanne Worley is more fun to listen to, but uh, Christopher Lee is definitely the most refined role in this entire movie. He gets to be so warm. It, 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 it's just so sweet. It makes me so happy. <laughs> Imagine, imagining like that, that TV casting thing. It's like, hey, Christopher Lee's in town. What about Christopher Lee? Can he do nice? I've met him. He's nice. He's a nice guy. He can probably play that. There's nothing he can't play. He can play warm and fatherly. I, mean, I feel like that's part of it. Is it's like Christopher Lee absolutely strikes the kind of guy who got a reputation for like will show up on time, will give a good performance, like that kind of consistency. I totally buy. It's like we need mm -hmm. someone who can play four people. Who do we got? Ah, Christopher Lee's <laughs> available. Let's get, see if he is interested. He can... And again, like I mentioned before, not only does he have a voice with a lot of personality, he knows how to use it. He is a genuine like he's 
a good voice actor. Mm. He's, a, he's just a lot of fun here. Like, I, I appreciate that he takes so much time to, like, give distinct personalities to all the characters he's playing. Like, it's not just, like, and here's Christopher Lee pitched up slightly. And here's Christopher Lee pitched <laughs> down slightly. <laughs> and otherwise, it's like... Here's Christopher Lee with a Scottish exactly, accent. Exactly, and it's just, like, kind of... You can tell it's just him the entire time. Like, he, he takes the time to, like, try and make them sound like distinct people. And I, I appreciate that. That's really well done. Yes, yeah, much like cooking, make sure that you use all of the Christopher Lee. Leave <laughs> nothing unused. And the thing, the thing I appreciate the most about Christopher Lee is uh, something that I didn't really pay attention to for the other characters, but you kind of have to for Drosselmeyer. You'll notice that the mouth movements for his character are the same. Okay, it's a slot cut out where you put different mouth shapes that they do for many of the Rankin Bass stop motion films. Like you can see the lines where they move the mouth back and forth. And because it's so pronounced compared to all the other characters, uh, Christopher Lee has to be really didactic. All of his syllables have to match with the lips that are moving, even though they were originally designed around the Japanese voice, not an English one. And there's almost no break in there. The sync is really in tune. And it mm -hmm. does that without dropping his enthusiasm. That scene near the beginning where the camera is kind of pivoting around the bed which uh they really like to do in this movie and he's talking about how he's wanted to make like this perfect doll and he's always had problems with it and this one has buck teeth don't you see how it is not the most perfect person ever but i put a lot of heart into it like all of that warmth and energy and character is conveyed without breaking the lip sync and it's um honestly a modern miracle that they were able to do that in the late goddamn 70s of all times Considering but that's that something is... that anime dubs struggled with for the longest time. Indeed. If, if, oh, and they even... They, they should be so lucky to have someone a quarter as talented as Christopher Lee in their booths, right? Indeed. We needed to cast Christopher Lee in way more English dubs. That, that would have solved everything. They made Angel Cop better. How? They had Christopher Lee play all the roles. Oh, that <laughs> well, let's not go crazy here. Some things are... <laughs> He's not a goddamn wizard. Are we sure? <laughs> okay. Oh, dear. Oh, he's not God. All right, you got me so there. I, I can't make that joke. <laughs> now, the last thing I wanted to bring up is um, uh, this is probably more in Amon's wheelhouse is uh, is the music, uh, not the Tchaikovsky music, which they uh, they, they interestingly enough they got the um, which orchestra did they get for this? They got the. I wrote it down here somewhere. The new Nihon Philharmonic Symphony Orchestra to do a lot of the instrumentation on this, which is why it sounds really nice. But what I wanted to talk about was the original songs because they actually have insert songs in this in Japanese originally, and then they had to be re-recorded, rewritten, re-everything into English. So the, ca the guys who did that are the duo by the name of Randy Bishop and Marty Gwynn who, I'm sorry, I didn't really find very much about, aside from, like, uh, bit uh, songwriting and some songs from that time period that... It's like the kind where you may have heard it if you were around in the time, but if you didn't, it's nothing that's really still in radio rotation nowadays. Do either of those names stand out to you, Amon? No. Uh, like, okay. I, 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 I don't... Like... As far as I get to... Like, Randy Bishop appears to have been a professional songwriter around this time, working in L.A., which is, I assume is how he got this gig. And as far as I can mm -hmm. tell, him and Marty Gwynn did an album that also came out in 1979. So I'm assuming he got the gig to adapt things because he was a professional songwriter. He was working with this other woman at the time anyway, so they, you know, you know, the song required to do wet, that's we pull in to work on it. I don't think either of the... As far as I can tell, the most famous thing is in the... What is it? Uh, in like in in like uh, like about a year or two after this, uh, Marty Gwynn was in like a trio called the Coyote Sisters that were apparently very briefly popular for a little bit. I think this is about as much success as any of them ever had. Like they seemed like they were mostly like people who worked flavor of yeah, flavor of the month, kind of just around. Or and then they got or, the game. Or like, or like Bishop seems like the kind of guy who probably did a lot of like behind the scenes type work as like a songwriter, but not necessarily got very famous as a right. performer. Uh, well, it's unfortunate because I, I go ahead and give me your thoughts on the actual sound, but I, I kind of like their singing. Like, I think that they're, 
very full, um, harmonized sound uh, recreates a lot of those insert songs pretty well. It's like as good a dubbed version of an original Japanese song as I think we could reasonably ask for in 1979. No, it's, it, it, yeah. it, it, it sounds really nice, and my first suspicion was that these people probably came from, like, the L.A. session music world, because that is just full of people who are, like, extreme mm-hmm. professionals who can do a lot of different styles and will produce at least, like, consistently good work all the time, because that's literally their job. Uh, right. and, and from what I can tell, like, again, they're not famous, but like, yeah, that appears to be like how they got the gig because they're, they're from that kind of section of the, of the entertainment industry in LA. And I also find it interesting that the, the songs themselves, like, um, uh, Dance of the Dolls and a couple of the other insert songs, I don't know what the Japanese pop music sound was at the time period, because the only song I know, uh, in Japanese from this time period is Fire Treasure, the intro song to The Castle of Cagliostro, which also came out uh, in 1979. Um, do, do you know anything about, like, does this sound like what Japanese pop music was in this time period? Not pop I music, mean, I, not as far as like I know, I, and admittedly my knowledge is very limited. I, I mean, I want to say this sound probably existed. I don't know if it was, like... Yeah. Because, like, like, this, this, I mean, the... My knowledge of like J- Japanese pop music from this time is also kind of limited, but like this definitely rem- there's mm. definitely strains of like American soft rock this sounds like, and I'm sure some of yeah. oh, yeah. that sound existed in Japan around the same time. So like this this might have been a so, pop sound. I don't know if it was necessarily like the hardcore classics that everyone still remembers forty years later kind of stuff though. Although credit where it's due, even though the lyrics to Dance of the Dolls are kind of is kind of surreal itself, it's also a total earworm. And oh, it has a yeah. very 70s sound, mm-hmm. for lack of better phrase. No kidding. It, it, it is that kind of Japanese, not Japanese soft rock, but that, that kind of soft rock from that era. Yeah. Yeah, I was trying to think of, like, what, what does this remind me of? Because it, it's, like, nostalgic for something that you've never heard of before. <laughs> and I was, I was trying to remember, like, what, what does this remind me of? I, I know I've heard songs like this on, like, oldies radio stations or, like, my parents' old CDs. I couldn't pick, like, an act that it reminded me of the most. I was like, this is like the waning days of Bee Gees-inspired harmonization or something like that. Yeah, also getting, like, early era of, like, hollow notes or air supply. That Not quite yacht rock, yeah, but we're getting I mean, it's, there. It's, it's, you can definitely, <laughs> yeah, you can definitely hear, like, yeah, it's not yacht rock, but it is, like, again, L.A. session people, which is what a lot of why yacht rock sounds like that is because that's the kind of people who are playing on it. Uh, it's definitely, like, it's it's very glossy, it's very West Coast, it's very, like, mid to late 70s. Glossy, that's a good yeah, gl- term Glossy would be a good word for a lot of this. Like, in a good way, but glossy, definitely. Yeah, yeah, it, it's dated, but it's the good kind of dated. So, that, co- that pretty much covers all the audio side of uh, Nutcracker Fantasy, and, um, I, I think the only other thing to ask, the, the only other big question to really ask is... What did anyone in the time period think of this movie? Because uh, Amon did the excellent work of being able to go out and find some reviews from the time period about what people in 1979 actually thought of this movie in America. Turns out, not a whole lot of positive stuff. <laughs> it's there. It's <laughs> that's pretty much it. It's there. Oh. It's, it's it's very much. I mean, it's it's. I didn't find one. I didn't find one that the New York Times ever wrote, but it has that same vibe of like stiff white dudes who clearly think this movie's a little beneath them, and are probably a little. That's not all of them, but you do get that sense of people who are like, "Yep, another kids movie. Got to mm-hmm. write about it for the paper." <laughs> <laughs> Although I like the one who compared it to the other children's films coming up right around the same time, because this got a wide release apparently right around the holiday season. It was 1979. And it's like, I'm not quite into this, but at least it's not the fish that <laughs> saved Pittsburgh. <laughs> Put that on the poster. Which is a really obscure, bad live action Disney movie. <laughs> Everything from that time period is an obscure Disney movie. I know that's, that's the one thing that surprised me about Sanrio never quite taking off. Is my my impression is this is kind of when Disney was not doing great, and it's weird to me. No, nope. you're correct. It's, it's it's like I know this. I know it doesn't work like this, but it's always weird to me. It's like why did they not see this much better animated movie instead? 
Yeah, it made me sad how many of these critics, and a lot of them for like major regional papers, like from Philadelphia, St. Louis, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, how many of them were critical of the animation itself? Like, oh, this is kind of perky jerky and makes me think of TV. And really, if anything, this is kind of the last hurrah for what was left of MOM Productions. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. they, at this point, this movie came out, they had been working for over 20 years in Japan making stop motion animation for advertisements, for shorts, and for all the sub license stuff they did for Rankin Bass. Yeah, yeah. it's, I mean, it's funny, it's funny watching this. I mean, it's funny reading those in very aware of the fact that like if this had come out like a decade earlier it probably would have been been a lot like even like um i think one of the philadelphia critics noted that like so when i was a 10 this pop this stop motion animation hansel and greta movie came out and me and my cousin saw this about <gasps> yeah. four dozen times I remember that and as an adult i feel like i have criticisms of this movie but the 10 year old that's still inside me is overjoyed at this movie and i can't deny that and it's and, and i'm kind of that though. way too because like they clearly got a lot of money, and they put it all on the screen. You have these huge, elaborate sets, and just dozens and dozens of characters on the screen, all you know, moving around. Whether it's doing like little synchronized dances or, or other things, and that that's last, yeah, that's that hard, expensive sequence. stuff for stop mm. motion. Especially that that uh, final sequence where it's it's set to the Nutcracker Suite, and you, you've got everyone just dancing around in you know, a dream sequence. You've got see-through horses. You've got morphing characters that turn into like flowers and the other characters again you're You've right got fountains that is and the the fountain stuff like the fountain is in there a lot like you see the camera is constantly moving but the fountain like the water fountain is still spewing up all the time to to really convey the sense that this is a real living world that you can only see in the realm of stop motion that's really impressive it's like the kind of stop motion that we would see kind of uh, I don't I don't think it was homaged exactly but it's like the same kind as the intro to Beastars, stars where they're dancing in front of a water fountain yeah this, this, this I mean this this feels like a movie that is it's its reception was undone both by I think a lot of the people reviewing it probably didn't appreciate how difficult all the stuff on screen was uh, and it just being this weird dead period where like puppetoons is a thing in the past. And no one, no one's Ready? old enough to have like nostalgia for like you know sort of the rank and bass sort of TV stop motion stuff, which I feel like was kind of the last hurrah of that for a lot of people in the United States that aren't old enough to be like, oh, this this reminds me so much of this thing that meant so much to me as a child, and I can appreciate it uh, through that lens, kind of a thing. It was it I was definitely in its dying days because like the same year this movie came out, the the latest rank and bass holiday special was Rudolph and Frosty's Christmas in July. <laughs> So, oh boy. which did not come out during Christmas time. So, so yeah, they would actually continue making the uh, the Animagic, which is what they refer to that that animation style with stop motion, all the way up to 1985. But yeah, this mm -hmm. is definitely kind of the dark days. So we're well past the peak of like Rudolph and uh, the Little Drummer Boy, which the director Takio Nakamura actually directed, uh, or even like. Uh, Nestor or Here Comes Santa Claus, like the the good days are, are kind of no, past. I, I, I mean, I definitely don't think it helped that like for a lot of these critics, if it reminded me of anything, it would be those later rank and bass ones. It was like this just looks like the crap they show on TV every year. Pass. Right. <laughs> and there was a it was a time period uh, not long after this, which again, this is why I say this film came out too early. Gumby had a huge resurgence in the mid '80s. It became like a cult thing where they showed it in art house films along with like. The Clockwork Oranges and the 2001's A Space Odyssey, and which even Weird. led to a revised TV show getting made when Art Clocky finally got out of his hippie phase. So, yeah, this could have found an audience with, like, that hipstery art house crowd, but it, it just wasn't the right time period or wasn't billed to the right people. It, I, I feel like it's almost its problem. Like, cause, you know, obviously it's Sanrio, they want a wide release, but oddly, yeah, I think if it had gone for more of, like, a arty kind of a thing, it might have gotten a better reception, even if it would have made, like, way less money like right. whatever this whatever this things... pulled in like by itself probably endorsed whatever like an art house like circuit would have given it it definitely didn't make a whole lot in japan no. either uh, it's my understanding mm -hmm. that it, it wasn't really like like all sanrio movies it wasn't a major blockbuster it didn't make back the budget that it took to make it and it, it didn't really have like a lasting impact despite the fact that there was a remake for it uh, yeah, they did a remastered version, which was yeah. uh, for a company anniversary in 2014. And they 
But the thing is, they completely redubbed the cast, completely new actors. They turned up the color gradients to just like gaudy levels. Ugh. They added in a bunch of new, mostly uh, cell animation or like digital animation to kind of tie things together or enhance the special effects. And they added a song by Kiari Pamu Pamu at the end. Is, and it's that like sounds like a hot mess. <laughs> I've, I've seen like clips a... of that version online, and really, I don't feel like it really needs to be dressed up like that to make it relevant to modern audiences. No. No. That's, that's going a little overboard. It just it just needs to, to get out there and be seen and appreciated for what it is, which is what Discotech mm -hmm. did. Yeah, every and it's and you know if you look at uh, the the anime community, a lot of people revisit this around the holiday season every year. You can go back to last. Ever since Discotech relicensed it and it's been up for streaming, people just keep revisiting around the holiday season. And yeah. not with derision like those uh, newspaper critics, but a lot with the like, this is really interesting and I kind of wish that there was more of this. Heck, last year, at least at the time of this recording, uh, Discotech uh, looped it over and over like a Christmas story all day on Twitch. Really? On, on Christmas Day. So nice. yeah, at any point you could do it and watch it, which I thought was really that sweet. Nice. That is. There was even because... like a little a special intro video for Mike Tool. I did see that. I, I watched that uh, uh, intro bit, which very informative. Not so much on like the dub side of it, which again we, we spent a lot of time like looking up the American side of the production before doing this podcast, and I think we've found basically as much as there is available out there. So I'm just glad that the dub is still out there. I'm glad that it wasn't lost to time and that it's readily available, so we can have a little slice of what dubbing for foreign language fair was like in the late 70s before it became the cultural phenomenon that it became many years after that so to wrap this all up uh i guess what's everyone's final thoughts on the dub of nutcracker fantasy aman what a delightful movie like i i really enjoyed this and i think the the dub has its rocky parts but i think the parts of it that are good really they fit really well with this like this is a fun, weird fantasy movie. It's the most fun I've had experiencing the story since being like a small child and having my family drag me to the Boston Ballet production, which I saw at least twice of the Nutcracker, <laughs> at least twice during my childhood, which I was not into ballet, but like, that was fun. Uh, they had a sword fight with a mouse. Can't be that. Yeah. Uh, and this, 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 this felt like, yeah, this, this is just like, it's a fun movie. Like, the, the dub kind of shows its age in places, but I think like, you get performances like Christopher Lee and Joanne Worley, who I think really do help hold the movie together when they show up. Um, yeah, like I, I don't know if I'd say you, you should you should watch this over the Japanese version, but like if you don't want to read subtitles, this is not a bad way to experience the movie. You still get all that lovely animation, and I feel like you know it's it's still just it's a it's a delightful movie. Watch it with your probably slightly older children. I feel like <laughs> yeah, yeah. If, they're, if they're a little on the young yeah, side, yeah. they might just get kind of wigged out. I don't know if wigged out, I think it's... Uh, I'm sorry, I was explaining to these guys before. I think it may be, because of its age, it may be a little harder to pitch to younger mm -hmm. kids who do need their hands held and need, like, visual stimulation for uh, something. This is not going to compete with Into the Spider-Verse, is all I'm trying to say. <laughs> or uh, Mitchell's versus the Machines. I can't, I can't but... say you're wrong. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. But, um, I'm, uh, Megan, you were saying about uh, the, the dub. I was going to say... If I have to uh, pick which version of the film I'm probably going to watch on my own just for a good time, I'm immediately going to stick with the sub because, I don't know, I, I enjoy its kind of bonkers energy. The fact that it's sometimes a little scarier or a little more quiet and contemplative or sometimes just a little weird or just just sometimes it's just showing off for the sake of showing off stop motion animation. But I, I don't think the dub hurts it that badly. I, I, I agree with Amon that it's very well done for its time and that its strengths are kind its strengths are stronger than its weaknesses and it, it's perfectly suitable for viewing with slightly older kids it, it's in a way it kind of feels like a lost holiday special in, in the vein of something like rudolph like it's just this wonderful little oddity you never knew existed but now i know it exists and i, I kind of love it but there's no christmas stuff in it how can it be a holiday special Look, if I can look, if I have to listen to idiots on Twitter talk about how Die Hard is or is not a Christmas movie oh. every goddamn year, this can qualify as a Christmas movie. 
<laughs> My answer is I don't care. Die Hard's good. I'm going to watch it whenever I want to watch it. Stop it. <laughs> Get help. <laughs> Stop. Get help. <laughs> Thank you, Michael Jordan. Well, um, I can't be the dissenter in this uh, discussion either because... I also agree that uh, for the time period, and especially for the talent that they got, this is a very well done dub for something that clearly was given a lot of love and attention. And I, I gotta respect that it wasn't because an American studio had like a lot of faith in it, or that it was, uh, uh, I, I suppose it was tied to something that Americans were anticipating. It was because Sanrio was really gung ho about becoming well-known in the American sphere, and so they got connections that would turn in a really good performance. Now, could I, I would have absolutely loved to have seen the alternative dimension where this came out in American theaters, got a lot of praise, became like a, a big budget movie money maker, and absolutely made Sanrio as popular as they wanted it to be. And honestly, this dub is as good as we could have gotten for the time period. I can't really think of better way to direct these characters i can't think of a better way to adapt the kind of aristocratic elements of the characters into something americans would find a little more palatable and i cannot think of a better way that they could have adapted the songs in here because you know it, it was it had two choices they were either going to dub over the original japanese or they were going to do what the original kiki's delivery service dub did and just get entirely new songs for those sequences instead so for all the sound sides of it, Jack Woods, Mo well knows the sound editor, did a really good job on this dub section. And I'm probably going to stick to the dub just because I think that I'd, I'd like to appreciate the stop motion animation. Especially in that final scene where it's like a dream within a dream and they're partying out and Sanrio characters are popping up all over the place. I just love that little bit so much. I love when the animation gets out of control and it's just a joy to watch because you can only do that in a stop motion medium plus you got kids and they may got might get freaked out by things like giant clowns in the sky i i, I doubt it I, I and for me myself like you gotta keep in mind megan i've shown my kids weird check animated feature films by uh jan Svankmeyer and judy trinka before they're not gonna be freaked out by this dang you've gone all the way to Svankmeyer? that that's hardcore I mean, it's not like they were sitting there intensely watching it. They like, you see, like, out of the corner of their eye, like, huh, that's, uh, um, that's not what I saw in Coraline, but thank you, Dad, for showing us that. <laughs> I do love me some stop motion animation. And if you want to watch this, let's say that you are the kind of person who's, who's listened to this podcast and has thought to yourself, I've got an hour and a half to burn. I've seen all the Christmas movies. I think Die Hard is a Christmas movie. I want to watch this. Luckily, you can. Thanks to Discotech licensing, remastering, and releasing it, you can watch The Nutcracker Fantasy on Crunchyroll in both sub and dub. You can watch it on Retro Crush in sub and dub. You can also buy the Blu-ray version of it, which is available on home video. Anytime that Right Stuff has a Discotech sale, you should absolutely add this to your cart. Add it to your collection for your home video release schedule. I have... But by the and, time this is coming out, you know, it's probably going to be part of the holiday sale. Pick it up then. There you go. If it's not, yeah, if you don't already have this, go ahead and grab it. I, I, it's the best holiday stop motion anime uh, Japanese film you can possibly get. But it's the only one like that, as far as I'm aware of. I had to put that disclaimer of best stop motion one, because otherwise some smart aleck in the comments was going to say, but what about Tokyo Godfathers? What about it's a Dante Miss Santa? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh wow. you know that. I haven't thought about that since I read your review of it, probably. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'm just mad that the last the, those that last thirty seconds preview didn't end up becoming an actual episode because it looked absolutely amazing. <laughs> oh. uh, okay, so where are we? Uh, the Dub Talk podcast is what you are listening to. And you can follow us here on YouTube if you're listening to us there. You can all follow us on all of our audio-only feeds such as Spotify, Apple, and Podbean. Or we release new episodes every Friday 
or if you want to be one of our patrons our patrons get the episodes early they get it on wednesday so if you want to be extra special and get the episodes a little bit early you can donate to our patreon just like these fine folks who i'm about to bestow all of the holiday joy upon merry christmas to megan's mom and dad merry christmas michelle travis merry christmas nico robin but with yaoi hands merry christmas sue tweet merry christmas victor may Baroda. and i'm going to bestow an even greater holiday extravaganza thank you to our ten dollar patrons who are the most amazing people who we would just love to take out for drinks to watch two-headed mice blow up nutcracker dolls with their mice demons every holiday season and those people are thank you carly lestikow you are amazing thank you crimson echidna you rock man thank you to jacob wilson keep rocking on rocking on thank you to jared hawkins thank you for all your support thank you to julia w keep being amazing Thank you, Marissa Lenti. You keep rocking on. You know what you're doing out there. And thank you so much to Otaku Anthony. Have the best holidays that 2021 can possibly offer. Before I sign off here, I want to know what are you two doing out in the world wide web? Aman, what do you do? Before I start, I want to mention one last thing that I meant to bring up early and forgot about. While, while, oh, while I was looking up articles on this, I found an article for a Christmas parade that's going to be happening in some part of Los Angeles the year this came out. And they list, like, all the people and, like, minor celebrities who are going to show up in it. You know what's in this? Uh, preview for this particular no, movie? No, apparently characters from the movie were going to be featured in the parade. Oh, wow! They do not specify what that means, that. but... this is per I'm guessing this is this is a testament to how much Sanrio were trying to push this thing. They were like, no... We need to get the youth of Los Angeles to see our movie. Let's put it in the Christmas parade. D does it actually specify, like, it's characters Char from character, the Nutcracker character, Fantasy and I, not from, just... From the news article, characters from Nutcracker Fantasy, a new movie scheduled for a Christmas release. Okay. that See, I'm wondering if, like, maybe they already had Nutcracker, like, costumes. Uh, like, you know, the soldiers or mice. And they were like, Wait, we're going to co-op this into promotion for this new movie coming that, that out. would definitely be the reasonable option but i'm really hoping that somewhere out there there's like you know slightly terrifying 70s like <laughs> clara and fritz costumes oh in God. the style of those like old like you know disneyland costumes from before disneyland before they really knew what they were doing and it's just kind of upsetting <laughs> My kingdom for photos I, of this. I, 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 My I, God. It was a, it apparently was it was taped at some point because they did a repeat broadcast of a TV showing of it. But I I, I don't know. Yeah. Let's go. It's got. We got. Let's go call this. KHJ in Los Angeles and see if they still have something. <laughs> I'll do one better. Lost Media Wiki. Get out there. Find a broadcast of the Los Angeles Parade from 1979. Specifically looking for the characters from the Sanrio movie Nutcracker Fantasy. It's got to be out there somewhere. Someone's got it on a Betamax. Uh, anyways. anyways, you can find me on Twitter at at Amandul US. Duel has to use in it. I talk about uh, movies and comic books and anime. And I like to talk about music. Uh, and I'm going to give you a dusty old song. Now, I could have done like I did with the Magnetic Rose episode and give you a bunch of classical music that I don't really listen to and can't really recommend. Uh, but, I, but as I mentioned <laughs> earlier, the yeah. people who adapted the songs on this put out an album. Uh, you yes. can't really buy it. Uh, it never made the leap to CD. It was done on, like, some subsidiary of NCA. It's, you know, a... a, a uh -uh. You can find it. You can find rips of it on YouTube, though. Uh, but I did give a listen to some of it. It's not bad. Like, do you like smooth, like, late 70s, like, AOR pop? Like, you'll probably enjoy this. Like, uh, do you, you know, do you like the Carpenters but wish they'd be a little grittier once in a while? God damn it. <laughs> you'll enjoy this. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, when I hear Rainbow Connection by the Carpenters, I'm just thinking, I really wish this was just a little grittier. Why, why, just a little more Why bite. would you listen to Rainbow Connection? That is an awful cover of that song. I heard it once, and it's like, oh, oh no, this, why, how? Because, it, you know it wasn't supposed to be released. It, it, the, the version we can hear is, like, the scratch recording oh, of it. Real? Oh, my God, no wonder. I'm so sorry, Karen. <laughs> oh. No, they, like... I mean, it makes sense that they covered that, because, you know, they, they had a number one hit with, um, what was the other one? Sing a Song, another song by, um, Williams. 
uh, Joe Raposo. So it makes sense that they want to cover the other big Joe Raposo song, Rainbow Connection. But yeah, that version was not, like, the professionally recorded mixed version of it. That, expl that at least explains why it sounds like that, I see. Yeah. Anyways, um, yeah, Bishop McGuinn, uh, like, the lead single was a song called Santa Monica Pier. It sounds nice. Like, uh, do you do you okay. like semi soft pop? Do you like yacht rock? Like, you'll probably enjoy this. It's it's certainly it's at least not painful. I realize that's <laughs> extremely faint praise, but I do mean that sincerely. <laughs> uh, for an act that no one has thought about or done any retrospectives on in probably the intervening years, that is that is high I praise because at least you're giving some recognition. Look, they, got, they got some professionals on this. Jeff Beccaro is drumming on this. Uh, he drummed with Toto and Steely Dan, so you know he's good. <laughs> Oh, Steve uh, Lucas yeah. on this. He was the guitar player in Toto. Like, there's talent on here at the very least. Like, it's a nice sounding album. I'll give it that. Certainly. Okay. What's it called? Uh, again? The album. The album yeah. is called "This Is Our Night." Gotcha. All right. So, special guest Megan, thank you so much for joining us. Please tell everyone what are you doing these days. Well, you can find me on Twitter at Brainchild129, where I talk about all sorts of things. Uh, of course, uh, by the point this comes out, I'll be wrapping up my annual holiday review gamut, where I review some of the best and worst titles of 2001, uh, 2021. 2001? Wish... Wow, you oh, like backed up. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that'd be kind of cool. It'd be, you know, be like, uh, what oh, has God. held up 20 years later? Oh, but God. that would take but a anyway. long time. Uh, you can find that. That's the Manga Test Drive, which is mangatestdrive.blogspot.com. I also have a side blog called Renaissance Jose, where, among other things, you can actually read my full review of this movie from last year. And if you want to, if you like what I do enough to give me money on the regular for it, you can do so. My Patreon is at Megan D. Indeed. You all, I know you all have extra money to burn because I see what holiday sales are like this year. Think about donating a couple bucks to Megan because she absolutely deserves it. And I, I mean it full sincerely. The next chance that we get to like get together for a convention, I am absolutely going there because we need to reconnect. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I am Noah Clue, and you can follow me on Twitter at Noah Clue. Uh, I do not currently have anything in production, but I would certainly like to because I've had a couple ideas for some videos that are dub centric related and if i finally get those off the ground then you can check those out on my youtube channel which is journey traveler and as far as other things going on right now i'm just using my twitter account to post uh probably me baking because i'm in the midst of my holiday baking right now i just baked 150 sugar cookies of varying shapes and thickness today and once we're done recording i am gonna go get started on peanut butter balls mm. so yay for holidays Yay, well, cookies. Yes, indeed. Don't even get me started on how, the frosting. That's going to take forever. Well, I, I think that's it. I think, I think we've woken up from this fantasy. So thank you, guys. Thanks for uh, being in on this episode. I'm happy to. Always happy to be here. Indeed. So uh, you all have a wonderful holiday season, and we will see you when we... Get uh, escape from the two-headed mouse creature. I still don't know what they were thinking with that design. I mean, that's usually how it's portrayed. My memory from the ballet as a kid is that the, the king mouse has two heads. Yeah, that's how it's supposed to look. I don't. I don't remember that. I, I haven't seen. I, I never got taken to see theater productions of this. So uh, maybe it's not. Maybe it's not as unique as I thought it was. But I bet none of those theater productions had the voice of J. Ann Worley behind them. Absolutely not. It's a ballet. No one talks. <laughs> or the Ragman. Yeah, that too. <laughs> I have no that that still is a th the thread that just got dropped. I have no idea what that was about. I'm gonna need a lot more nog to erase the memories of the Ragman. <laughs> Anyways, aloha and otaku on my holiday listeners. Back over Boston, rock out of Chicago. I just hope y'all are All ready right. for me to ramble on about the history of Sanrio films and motherfucking Christopher Lee. Test, test, test. Isn't that why we're here? I didn't expect to do anything else. I had all these notes about all these other actors and all these other animators and producers, but no, no, I just wanted to beat Chris, the Christopher Lee Be careful Lee what hour. you wish for. There's a lot I can talk about there. 
Yeah, well, also, <laughs> I, I am a huge fan of like that a whole gothic yes, it... 50s, 60s European horror thing. And of course, right. So, yeah, all over the that. Horror. <laughs> like, wh- wh- dang. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'd love to be in your movie, but uh, Peter has to murder me next like, week for a film. Like how Amon was last sorry. time when we were talking about a Thousand One Nights with Giallo films? Th- this is me with that, that version of horror. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I was out of the loop on that because that's just not a genre of movies that I know anything about if it didn't come from MST3K. So if you guys know more about Hammer Horror films and, you know, low-grade European B movies and, of that nature, just take here, the microphone and run TV. with it. I'll be glad lots to let you Lots and lots talk. of TV. <laughs> yep. 70s TV. TV. Again, it, I'm, I had fun researching this. That is absolutely for sure. Well, no. Doesn't mean I'm going to be able to watch any of these shows anytime soon, but I at least know they exist. What? What? I'm sorry. Oh, I you don't, don't know wa- where you can. You watch don't want to watch thirty-something-year-old soap say, operas. I was, I was gonna. I was gonna say, was gonna say TV. I, oh, me, me TV me probably. Are you familiar with me? Yes, TV? I. I do. It's one of those like freebie. It, it, um, no. Like with the digital channels, like the ones that are like point two or point three. Yeah. Yeah. Or Pluto. Okay, it's like yeah, tubby it, it's TV one of those things or... that'll Yeah, it'll it'll it, yeah, yeah, it's one of those Roku like digital channel. sub channels that is basically just nothing but like boomer reruns. Uh so But for like things that people in this generation have you, never I mean, heard you of. Might have before. Heard of it if you're like our age and like you're old enough that Nick at night was Or a lot still of this stuff thing. was in syndication. But like any Right. Any, yeah, exactly. But like people even like five years younger than us, like if they've heard of this, it's only because like their parents liked it and mentioned it to them. So is it uh, just as an example? Is like Absolutely. Gilligan's Island yeah, something like, that's on the westerns? Oh, okay. Any, oh, did it was okay. it popular between like the fifties, maybe the early seventies? It's probably rerunning on MeTV. That surprises me because I, I would think that like the the legacy shows, the ones that um, have like name brand recognition nowadays would be, like, a little harder to get a hold of from the rights holders. How else would they be making really money on it otherwise? Not, maybe there is yeah. nothing like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, they, they, I don't I don't think they're that right. stingy with this. This is, like, this isn't quite dead product, but, like, there's there's no value in being stingy with gun smoke. <laughs> no, there's no money there. there. 